As Chris said, you're here for winter flowers though. So welcome everybody. I uh, hope everybody had a wonderful holiday season. Hope everybody's new year is starting off very well. Ignore the news while we're doing this. You don't need to worry about what's going on out there. Nothing, nothing good probably. I'll go ahead and share my screen with you and get started talk about winter flowers. Uh, I know we have people who are joining us from all over the place. Uh, one of the things that perhaps is most surprising when people move down here from farther north is that we don't stop gardening. In a lot of ways, gardening during the winter is one of the more pleasurable times to garden because there's less heat, less humidity, fewer mosquitoes, and a lot of plants are really still very active all winter long for us. We don't, the, the soil doesn't freeze. We will often go without dipping into the teens, but maybe a couple times a year over the winter. Although here in Raleigh, it can get down into the single digits, but, but it rarely stays cold for very long. So we have a great opportunity for having a lot of flowers during the winter. For those of you joining us via YouTube or who often do, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us and all those sorts of things. That helps more people find us who have a similar interest. Now, I kind of broke this talk up. I kind of just went from kind of mid-December through the end of February in terms of what I was considering winter. And as always, it, it's all about what I leave out rather than what I put in because there are so many, so many plants that we could talk about. And in fact, I left out one of the big ones, which is camellias, because they really deserve a talk all their own. They don't, um, they're just so fantastic. I was going to leave out hellebores as well. I put in one slide of those and I'm glad because those were all, all the slides of the hellebores I took were pictures I took it. Pine Knot Farms with Dick Tyler, who Chris mentioned is going to be our speaker with the Rock Garden Society coming up. So that'll just give you a little taste of what's happening with hellebores now. So starting off in, in December and, and really before many of these plants start before, finish after, the Mahonias. We, Mahonias, you can kind of break up most of the ones we grow into fall and then winter into spring bloomers. I've had a love-hate relationship with Mahonias. I learned them, thought they were fantastic, kind of fell out of love with them. And a lot of that was because of how people grew them. People kept trying to make them into little round shrubs. You know, we have a little lot of shrubs, evergreen shrubs that are, you can keep small and round. Mahonia is not one you should try and do that though. And I came back, fell back in love with them when I saw them in England. And I saw them letting them grow up really tall. i had always been taught, you know, when these stems start getting tall and they get bare at the bottom, you want to cut back a third of those stems so they flush out down here and get full. And now I like to grow them so that they grow up tall and are bare at the bottom. They don't give too much shade because they don't get too wide until they get really old anyway. And so you can plant underneath them. And I think they're beautiful that way. The hybrid, the Mahonyx media types, these, these hybrids are some of the best for these November through December flowers. And you can really get ones with re these long racemes like Hope, which just gets loaded with flowers that kind of droop over and buckland. I like these, the ones that really stand up a little bit more. Gorgeous things, great for sun or shade. Uh, they will get little blueberries on there. You know, the Mahonias, the media types don't seed around quite so much as some of the others. The Beely eyes can be, with the broader leaves can, sometimes those pop up in the woodlands a bit. So you have to be careful about those. But the media types, we don't get them seeding around here that, that I've seen. There are other Mahonias in Mexico and down through Central America. We have Mahonias that often the Mexican ones tend to be not spiny. These, these other ones are, you know, got stiff, spiny leaves. That's why they call them grape hollies, between the fruits looking like grapes and the leaves like leaflets like hollies. But the, the Mexican and Central American ones tend to have these softer, more flexible leaves that aren't real vicious and don't grab onto you, which is interesting because in the 
southwestern U.S., you get some really super spiny ones. But they, some of these, like this Mahonia illicina or Mahonia pallida, that name seems to bounce back and forth. It's hard to tell if that's two different species. They grow these really long, long racemes of soft yellow flowers, cream to yellow flowers that can be easily, some of those racemes can be two feet, almost three feet tall and much branched. You see, this is, you know, one going out here, whoops, and then here it comes out and it branches to multiple flowers. Here you can see how there are multiple flowers on there. So it flowers over a very long period from November into January often. Much different looking than the Asian Mahonias that we grow, but really kind of soft and wispy. I think they're perfect for kind of the back of a border where they peak up above there in the winter and do their thing. We're looking for the most cold hardy forms because as they're from Mexico, not all of them are terribly hardy. We've got a couple that have been very, very good in the nursery. So we're, we're really we've got high hopes for them. Now, another plant that, that I could have put into kind of any of these months is the Algerian iris, iris unguicularis. This is a little evergreen iris, starts flowering in, in December or so, is flowering right now, will keep flowering in through, through February once you get a good, good clump going. It does tend to flower kind of low in the foliage. So it's something to consider when you're planting it, that it really, you almost need to have it somewhere where you can look right down on it. So near a path or on a slope or something like that seems to do best. The typical form, kind of pale blue, often a little bit streaky with that yellow tongue on there. That's pretty typical. And you can see they'll keep flowering with snow on them. Doesn't seem to bother them a bit. They just keep going and going. There are some other forms. This is one that's called great white that doesn't have any trace of the lavender blue in there. And this is one called winter dreams. I don't have the name on here, but winter dreams. That's a darker blue, especially on the, the fall right there with the, the surrounding that yellow. Really, really nice form. They're all great, easy to grow from mostly in shade. They'll go in full sun, but in, in shade, they do really well because they're really, you know, flowering and everything when the, the leaves have dropped from the deciduous trees above them. And so they're still kind of doing their thing then. They, they, they're not dormant, so they grow well. Seem to be quite hardy. I always say that you shouldn't live anywhere where you can't grow osmanthus. False holly osmanthus, osmanthus heterophilus, is one that flowers a little bit later than the fragrant osmanthus, osmanthus fragrance. It really starts kind of late November, mid to late November, and goes all the way. This is what a full-grown plant will look like in just loads of these little flowers. I didn't put a picture of young osmanthus heterophilus. When, when it's a young plant, the leaves look just like holly leaves. They're, they've got spines all across the edges. And then as it gets older and matures, it loses those spines. Uh, you can still see maybe a couple of leaves with some spines in there, but this, this mature one basically doesn't have any spines. And that's what heterophilus means, different leaves, because the leaves change as it ages. It'll flower even with the, the young spiny leaves as well. And this is one, we have evening events in the fall when people walk by this plant in full flower, you know, and they can't see it, they all stop and I want to know what it is. During some of our big events like Moonlight in the Garden, we actually usually station a volunteer on the path. This, this plant is growing near a path. We station somebody on the path. So when people are walking by and go, what is that? incredible fragrance, we can tell them, oh, it's this plant that's, that's right behind you here. And so they want to they wanna smell it. And if you're, if you're not in this area, if you're not in the Raleigh, North Carolina area, Osmanthus heterophilus is, is probably the hardiest of the, of the false hollies, the Osmanthus. It grows up into warm six, zone 6B. I know a lot of growers around here ship them up to kind of Long Island area. Doesn't want to get much colder than that, though. Now, there are a few different evergreen kind of winter flowering clematis, and most of them have really thick, leathery evergreen leaves, clematis armandii being the most typical one. But there's another winter clematis called clematis serosa, 
named for the spots in the, the leaves, that is this very delicate looking plant. It can grow to 10 or 20 feet if you if given the structure, but it flowers during the winter. It flowers December mostly. This is a one with a little bit darker called freckles that's got more of those spots in there. But these lovely little delicate things flower in the middle of the winter. So I love growing clematis serosa with other clematis or other vines that are flowering, you know, in the spring or summer. I will often, when I grow vines, I will plant three or four different vines together. So I get kind of flowers and interest all through the, the season. And clematis, uh, uh, this one especially, this serosa, because it, it won't take over the world, is a great one for growing with other vines or through other plants. You grow this on deciduous shrubs and the shrubs have lost all their, their leaves. And then it's middle of winter, it's December, and you've got flowers on the deciduous shrubs, which, which I think is just absolutely amazing. Um, I love growing them that way. And then if they're getting too big, you after they finish flowering, you cut them back in the spring before everything else starts growing so you can pull the vines out and everything and let them flush again. You don't have to cut them, but you can cut them to keep them a little bit more in check after they finish flowering. And they'll set flower buds for, for the next winter still. And there's so much going on. So a plant that I kind of waver on a little bit in terms of how much I like it is winter sweet, Chimenanthus praecox. Praecox means early. So January, that's, that's pretty early in the year for a plant that's flowering. Chimenanthus praecox, people love because it's fragrant. I don't have a great sense of smell, although it seems to be coming back a little bit. That's not a COVID thing. I've never had a good sense of smell. And for a long time, I couldn't smell this very well. I'm starting to be able to smell it better than, than I used to. So I could kind of see where, where it could have a place in the landscape. If you were going to grow winter sweet, Chimenanthus praecox, I'd suggest trying to find luteus because luteus has this nice dark gold flower. That's what this plant is. That's what this flower is. The straight species is more of a creamy yellow that is almost translucent, almost when it's wet. It doesn't show up very well. And my real knock against winter sweet is that during the rest of the year, it doesn't look like much. It's kind of a nondescript foliage. So I'm thinking I might actually put one in my landscape, which I, I never would have done years ago, but I'm going to put it in my woodland because the, the fragrance does really waft on the breeze far away from the plant. And I don't, I'm not wanting this right out in front of my house just because during the growing season, I don't think it's, it's beautiful. But I am getting really excited about some possibilities with this. Often when you see plants, when you grow them from seed, even if they're just that kind of pale color, you'll see some, some color, some red, uh, purple, right up around in the throat a little bit. And in the last uh, several years, when I've been in China and talking to people, I'll often come across people who talk about the work that's being done with chimenanthus, mostly for the cut flower trade is what they're saying, but where they're getting that purple to suffuse more and more of the flower. So um, but there are rumors that there are different color flowers on, on this. So there might be some burgundy ones that are coming out in the not too distant future. So I'm, I'm really excited to explore that a little bit more, see what else is out there, because that, that may get me a little bit more excited about the plant. Arbutus, I love Arbutus. Arbutus is in the Ericaceae family with rhododendrons and blueberries and Pieris, and you can kind of see that the Pieris type flower, that little companionate urn shaped flower that looks very much like our Pieris or some other plants in, in that family. Arbutus unido is a evergreen shrub or small tree. This is a dwarf one called Elfin King that we used to have growing right outside our visitor center, but, but still it's, it's a fantastic plant. During the winter, you get these little flowers and what's interesting, the flowers take a full year to mature. 
So when you have the flowers, you can have last year's fruit just getting ripe on the plant at the same time it's flowering in January, February timeframe. And the fruits are kind of maybe one inch diameter things. I was doing some, I was looking into this years ago and told people they were edible because unido means I eat one as an edible. But apparently what it means is I eat one, as in you only eat one and you don't eat any more. So I wouldn't recommend eating these. I have eaten the fruit. It didn't kill me, but it wasn't very good. And I wouldn't recommend anybody else eating it as well. But a great little evergreen plant, probably a little bit marginal, better in a zone eight garden than our 7B or planted up against a building or with some high shade to protect it a little bit. But if you ever see the the these on the in Ireland growing, they're they can be magnificent trees, and the stems on the the species, not this dwarf one, get kind of wonderfully contorted and really picturesque, and they look like these ancient ancient plants, even though they're not that old or that big. And one of the plants that people associate with us at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum are Prunus mume, known as ume in Japan. Prunus mume were one of Dr. J.C. Ralston's favorite plants. They flower in the middle of winter when nothing else, well, I say nothing else. I'm giving you a whole slide list of things that are flowering at the same time when very few other trees are flowering. You know, I, I'm always ready every, every January. I'll start getting emails about there is a cherry that's flowering in my, in my garden. And I'll say, does, or, you know, that's flowering, you know, down the street from me or out by the, out by Rex hospital. And I'll say, does it smell kind of spicy, sweet, like cloves? And I say, yes, overwhelmingly. And I say, well, that's Japanese flowering apricot, Prunus mume. And we see that every year. These are really the first ones to flower. And there are all kinds of different ones, pink flowered ones, white, dark, dark pink, almost red. There are weeping forms and contorted forms. A lot of the ones that we grow in for ornamental purposes, we grow a lot of the double flowered ones like these. Bonita is a double flowered one and Matsubara Red's a semi-double flowered one. And the, the really very doubled flowers like, like Bonita don't produce a lot of fruit. Whereas the single flowered ones are more likely to produce more fruit. The fruit is, think of a, a peach or an apricot, but with almost no flesh on it. It's kind of that fuzzy outer layer, a very thin bit of flesh, and then the, the seed, the, the pit, you know, like a peach pit or apricot pit in there. That said, the fruit is used very widely in Japan and is much loved. They make ume wines and jellies and pickled ume fruit, and all that's very good. I've had it. And where there are fruiting plants, often if you have any um, people who've moved from, you know, or first generation from Japan, they'll come and ask if they can collect all the fruits. And generally most places say, yeah, please. Cause otherwise they just, you know, kind of litter on, all over the ground, but they can be good. There are edible forms, ones that have more flesh on the fruit and, and maybe some different qualities to them. I'm not quite as familiar with those as I am with the, the more ornamental ones. Like I said, JC loved the plant. I do too, if you have room for multiple different types of plants. If I were only planting one tree, if I only had space for one flowering tree, I don't know if it would be Prunus mume because while it is spectacular over the winter, it's fairly nondescript over the course of the rest of the year, which is the same could be said for many flowering cherries as well that flower later in the spring. So, but it really is a one season plant. If you're ever curious about whether it's, it is a Prunus mume or not, one thing you can always look for is the young branches on ume will always be green. The one-year-old branches, you can kind of see it a little bit down here, will always be green, which is a really good ID characteristic for it. People who live around here are going to be upset about their Daphnes, I think. Probably going to be a few that are dying because all the rain that we've gotten this winter. 
Daphne odora is a short-lived evergreen shrub. These are two variegated ones I like. My Gema with the bright gold variegation and the pink flowers. And this Shinano Nishki with kind of the three color, dark green, yellowy, and then silvery green center with the pale pink flowers flowering in January. I love Daphne odora. People who complain because they die after four or five years, I say, that's fine. Just buy another plant and plant it because they're such fabulous things. They're easy to root your own. You can take cuttings and root it and have your own backups for when your older plant dies. The key for them is they want to be in well-drained soils or dry soils. So I plant them either on slopes where the water moves away from them or at the base of big deciduous trees that suck up all that water that they can get, especially in the spring and summer and fall. And, you know, they'll live for a long time. They're slow growing if you put them right at the base of a tree, but they do, they do very well that way. I also have taken to with my plants, if they're in a spot where it's really rich soil and are growing fast, I will cut them back pretty hard every two or three years right after they finished flowering. And they seem to love that being, being cut back like that. And they reflush and they get really dense and, and grow well. You know, once they finish flowering, if you've got just a plain green one, they're beautiful green. If you've, uh, if you've got a variegated one, you've got that great foliage all year round. They're unbeatable plants. And this is a plant that you can smell from 20 yards away. A lot of these winter flowering things like the Chimenanthus and the Prunus Mume and the Daphne Odora, the fragrance really kind of floats through the garden. And I've always, I've never seen research on it, but I always assume that is because there are fewer pollinators out during the winter. And so they can't just rely on, you know, pollinators coming by, they have to entice them. So it's one of the great things about a lot of these winter flowering plants is that they are really very fragrant. And, and that, that fragrance does just kind of waft around the garden, float all over the place. So you can smell these long before you see them. And these are both typical ones that come out, the buds are pink and then they open kind of dark pink and they open to pale pink, almost white. There are pure white flowered forms of Daphne odora that are somewhat hard to come by, but are some of my favorites as well. Another Daphne that is fairly strange in comparison is Daphne pseudomesereum. This is a picture of it taken in, in January. The buds are just getting set right now. It's got, they're just showing a little bit of yellow on the tips. Otherwise they're, they're closed pretty tightly and they'll open up from January through February and, and even into March. What's strange about these is once temperatures start to rise and the days get longer, it will drop every one of the leaves. And you'll just be left with these kind of stout, almost, almost fleshy branches with no leaves, no flowers. It looks like it's gone dead. And then the next fall, when it start, days start getting short again, it'll flush out with leaves and it will start flowering again in January. It just goes completely summer dormant. Now I assumed, because Daphne are native to Asia, but also in through Mediterranean regions, I had always assumed that th this was a response to this plant being from a summer dry area. That as a response to it being so dry during the summer that it just went dormant and then leafed out when it was cooler and wetter in, in the winter. And there are quite a few Mediterranean plants that do that, herbaceous plants mostly. And in fact, there are almost no temperate, cool temperate woody plants that go summer dormant. There are very, very few of them. And it turns out that Daphne pseudomesereum is actually from Japan where it's not Mediterranean at all. It's very, a some climate very similar to our own. And I read a research article, it just came out, I think 2019 from some folks in Japan 
that they hypothesized and did some studying that lends weight to their hypothesis. I don't know that they proved it, but lends weight to it anyway, that the, the summer dormancy of Daphne pseudomeserium is, is actually a response to a plant that is a, adapted really for more sun, but, but it adapting to growing in woodland environments. And the way that it did that was by dropping its leaves and not photosynthesizing when light levels were lower, when the deciduous forests it grew in were in full leaf, but leafing out as those, those deciduous leaves fell and taking advantage of the winter to photosynthesize. And when compared to some very similar, closely related Daphnes that were evergreen and ones that were summer green, this wintergreen form, the carbon levels and activity in it seem to bear that out. So it can grow in more full sun, but you can grow it actually in pretty heavy deciduous shade and it doesn't have a problem at all. So it's kind of a interesting adaptation and it's, it makes you wonder why other plants haven't evolved with that same adaptation. It's fascinating. If anybody's interested, I can send you a link to the, that study. Mentioned hellebores. We've got hellebores that are already starting out in the garden and they will continue through January and February. February is perhaps when it, they really peak in the garden. This was one day last year. I stopped in at Pine Knot Farms up near Henderson, North Carolina. Actually the weekend before their open days for hellebores. And these were just in about 15 or 20 minutes, these were the pictures I took from their, uh, their collections there. It just some beautiful, beautiful plants. If you're anywhere within the region, you should definitely make an effort to go up there during their, their open nursery days for their, their hellebore days, where you can see the hellebores in flower and select the ones that you want. I'm still kicking myself that I didn't get this one. That one that one speaks to me on a very deep level. <laughs> I want it. But they have everything from almost pure black to really good yellows and pure whites and pinks to speckles and picatees and bicolors and these shaded ones. I really love these ones that kind of look like water lilies, what these is, doubles. What is the nursery's name? Pine Knot Farms. And they're Thank up you. near the North Carolina, Virginia border. They're, they're just, they're fantastic. It's owned by Dick Tyler. He's, Chris mentioned, he'll be the speaker for the Rock Garden Society this month. So if you go to our calendar, you'll be able to see the, that, that talk on there. And um, he, will, he will be able to tell you more about hellebores than I ever will. He and his late wife wrote a book on hellebores. His wife did a lot of the writing. Judith did most of the writing, but Dick did the photography for it. So you know there'll be some great photos in the, that talk. Another one that people probably know are the witch hazels. Depending on the type, the witch, angels, witch hazels start in the fall and continue through the spring. The hybrid ones, ex intermedia, mostly are in the middle, January into February for a lot of them. You know, sometimes people talk about 50 mile an hour plants, you know, which kind of, what are plants that'll stop you at 50 miles an hour? Most of, many of the witch hazels won't stop you, but sunburst certainly will, amethyst, primavera. This one, the orangey coppery ones, you maybe don't notice if you're flying by them, but certainly if you're walking by, you do. And these also, I'm told, these, these witch hazels often have very good fragrance. That's still a... a a scent that I can't really distinguish very well. Now, this one, this is one that always gets mispronounced. You get people who call it Jelena, which is not correct. And you get people who call it Helena, which is also not correct. It's actually a soft J, Yelena, because it's named for a, a European. They love these and a lot, they do a lot of work with these in the Netherlands and in Germany. So this is Yelena, not Helena. Or Jelena. Always reminds me of, I, 
I have simple taste. The the comedy Weatherman. I don't know if you if you've ever seen that, but there's one part where you know it's supposed to be set in the '70s, and Will Ferrell's talking about a new hobby he and his girlfriend are doing. And he says he says it's it's called jogging, or perhaps jogging. It might be Scandinavian, but apparently you just run, which somehow always cracks me up. All right, moving into February. Um, and you'll see in this picture, these are three magnolias. People from farther north think of magnolias as spring plants, but really they're winter plants in a lot of cases for us. Many of the big saucer magnolias, the Sulangianas like this one, are flowering in February. And the star magnolia, stellata, are flowering in, in February for us. That's a pink stellata as well. So we really... February is when we really get the peak of, of our deciduous magnolias in flower here. One of what's, what's often considered the earliest of the deciduous magnolias is the Yulon magnolia, magnolia denudata, which usually is a kind of creamy white yellow flower. Forest's pink is a really nice pink form that was collected in the wild by George Forrest. It's a absolutely spectacular plant. It grows into a pretty large tree. You know, these can be, if you get a freeze at the wrong time, many of these early flowering ones just get wiped out. And so a lot of the, the modern breeding for magnolias has been to push the flowering later and later and later in the season so that there's less chance of them being hit by frosts, which makes sense because on a year where we don't get a frost, the magnolias are absolutely outstanding. And then there are some years where it looks like somebody just wadded up old brown paper towels and hung them from all of our deciduous magnolias and they don't look very good. Another early one, magnolia zenii, a little bit finer textured plant, smaller flowers than magnolia denudata, but very good one. Uh, there's several species that kind of have this this look to them, that, that white kind of interior with the pink blushing on the outside. Lovely plant. And from what I can tell, the first magnolia that we planted here at the Arboretum, Magnolia Lebneri Merrill. This is in our white garden and it's beautiful. You can see on the big plant, there's just a trace of pink in there, but really mostly white, pretty good sized tree. Given time, a lot of these yeah, you know, this is probably sold as a 25 foot tall by maybe 15 foot wide small flowering tree. In reality, you know, it grows to 40 feet tall and almost as wide with time. It's just, it's just how long the plant's in the ground and it's going to keep growing. But beautiful things. And some of the larger magnolias are some of the prettiest ones. I didn't put a picture in here, but Magnolia Galaxy is one from the the National Arboretum, that's a beautiful plant. And I should also say that the, I just put deciduous magnolias in here. We've had evergreen magnolias that started flowering in November, December, and we will have evergreen magnolias flowering all the way through spring for us. Magnolia Maudier and Cavalierii will flower right through the winter. Now you may not have room for a big magnolia, but you know, there's some little flowering plants as well. The reticulata type irises like Gordon and Catherine Hodgkin that come up kind of before or as their leaves are coming up. These are, they want a well-drained kind of baking soil once they come up. So we have them in our scree garden, but if you just get them in any good well-drained garden soil, they, they do very well. And over time, they'll, they'll bulk up and you'll get more and more, you'll get a bigger and bigger clump. And if they ever start, you know, they'll, every year you'll get more and more flowers. If you ever go the other way where they, you start getting fewer flowers, well, as soon as they finish flowering, if you dig them up and divide them and replant them, that'll kind of rejuvenate them and, and get them going again. But whenever plants like this, the flowering decreases, that's a sign that it either needs to be divided or that it's getting too shady where you planted it. It might've been in a lot of sun earlier, but in this, you know, earlier in the life cycle, but other plants around it have grown up and are starting to shade it. So you do need to sometimes move plants around. 
Same is true for this yellow one. This is a species Iris, Dan, Iris Danfordiae. Comes up very early. Really lovely things. Love all these little dwarf irises, or very early ones. And some of the Cornelian cherries, so named because they get red fruits. These are dogwoods, but they get kind of good size red fruits. This is one from the Arboretum that has beautiful exfoliating bark. And then these gorgeous yellow flowers, it looks like little fireworks going on there. But it'll start flowering in, in February. You see there's no leaves on these things behind it at all. This is all from the previous season. It makes kind of a broad, a low, broad-headed tree. It can be really picturesque, often gets pretty good fall color as well. A new one that I'm excited about, and I just have a this one picture because it's it's such a young plant for us, called Saffron Sentinel. Now it's Cornus moss. Cornus officinalis and Cornus moss are very similar. Cornus moss flowers a little bit later than officinalis and is not quite as happy with our heat typically. But I'm really excited to see this one because it's supposed to be an upright growing one. And one of the problems I have with the old Cornus moss and officinalis is they can be so broad that if you're a plant lover like me, you know, they take up a lot of space in the garden. And, and I will say, this is a plant that's worth taking up a lot of space because you get these great flowers in February, then the bark is beautiful. The leaves are nice. It gets big, bright red fruit on it. So it does, it is a multi-season plant. But I'm really excited to see how the bark matures on this saffron sentinel and how wide it actually does get because I think it could be a real winner. And getting into cherries, we think of cherries as spring, but there's some very early ones. Prunus okame is one of the most common, very early cherries that you see. That's a Japanese selection. Prunus first lady is from the National Arboretum, and it flowers about the same time as Prunus okame. I believe it's the same hybrid as okame, or at least it's thought to be. But whereas okami is a very pale pink that can be a little bit washed out, First Lady is really super, super vibrant. It's got the Taiwanese Prunus Companionata as one of the parents. And you can kind of, if you're familiar with that plant, you can kind of see it with the way that these, the flowers all kind of hang down and, and have that cap. And Prunus Companionata is a very early one as well, but it's not terribly hardy. Whereas First Lady is really a first rate early flowering plant and stays relatively small. Rhodes, they're evergreen rhododendron and they're deciduous azaleas, all of which are rhododendron. But even when rhododendron and azalea were separated into two groups, there were a group of deciduous rhododendron. And they fall into this group with a couple plants, mucronulatum, the Korean deciduous rhododendron, and rhododendron doricum. These are about the earliest ones in the garden to start flowering, uh, mucronulatum. This is kind of what the typical species looks like, at least what's in cultivation. But then there are darker ones, you know, more, more richer pink, like Cornell pink, and these just darker mahogany red. And so no leaves on the plant when it flowers. And, but then it, it leaf out and almost diamond shaped leaves, which are kind of nice. After mucronulatum, a related one, rhododendron doricum will start flowering. This is kind of what you typically see in cultivation as pink flower, but there is some other forms like this white Madison snow, which, which I'm very, very fond of. I'd really like to do a whole collection. These grow very well for us. So I'd like to do a whole collection of uh, mucronulatums and doricums and try and collect some of the related species as well, like sanctum and some of the other ones, because I haven't, don't have as much experience growing those. But these are going well before our other rhododendron and our other azaleas are, are even thinking about flowering in the garden. Another little bulb, Nathascortum selawianum. This is a South American bulb. Now this is one that you do need in a very, very well-drained spot. It will not tolerate excess moisture. The best thing to do is if you have a spot that you can, that's kind of gravelly and really well-drained, 
if it's right by like a sidewalk or where it gets reflected heat or something like that, that just bakes, 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 it does really well. This is a good type of bulb to put down. If you've got a really sunny patio, uh, you know, flagstone patio or path with gaps between them, if you dig out those gaps and make sure that's all very, all sandy and gravelly down through there, you can plant these little heat loving bulbs around in those cracks and they just, they bake in there over the summer. They'll come up, they stay dry. These little bulbs love it. But this little bulb only goes about an inch or two tall. Looks like a little crocus when it, when the flowers open up, but it is a different thing. Talked about the Daphnes before, both the evergreen and the winter green ones, but we also have summer green ones that are, that are winter deciduous. Daphne ginkwa, the lilac Daphne, which drops its leaves like many other plants do in the fall. And then in wet winter, in February, it starts flowering. And it's just, you can see why they call it the lilac Daphne, because they look, the stems covered in flowers look almost like lilac flowers. And it's nicely fragrant, not like Daphne odora, but it is pleasantly fragrant. And it's really interesting. I have pictures of this same plant in our laugh house taken different times with different sunlight. Um, I kind of wish I'd put several of them in here, but this, you know, looks like a really nice soft lavender. I have ones where it looks pink. I have ones where it looks almost blue and it really depends on how the light is hitting it, how it looks in the landscape. These are the same plants. So you can see how different that color looks, but it's, it's the same one. It's kind of a lilac -y color more than, more than pink or blue. Beautiful plants though. Again, like other Daphne, they do want a pretty well-drained soil, especially for this one, especially good drainage during the winter. And uh, Viburnum, this is Loris Tinus. If you ever read old English books, they talk about Loris Tinus somewhat, the Loris Tinus hedge, that's Viburnum Tinus. Now typical Viburnum Tinus, Loris Tinus is an evergreen shrub with nice pink buds. The buds form in by late fall and cover the plant through most of the winter and then they open up to white flowers in February. So this is it in bud. Now this new one, Lisa Rosa or Shades of Pink, opens up to pink flowers and I think it is much more effective as a flowering plant than the other, than the older forms of of viburnum tinus. It also seems to be a bit hardier than, than some of the forms, some of the older forms that are out there. So I've been really impressed with this shades of pink loris tinus a, as a shrub. And any of these winter flowering shrubs and trees, if you want to prune them, you just prune them immediately after flowering and they'll all have, they'll all form buds for next year and flower next year. Couple of last things, a pieris, this, this Taiwan pieris, as opposed to the Japanese pieris, starts, it starts flowering earlier than the Japanese pieris, although they do overlap. The Japanese pieris will start kind of late February into March. This is one from the Arboretum that I think we're probably gonna name because it is so fragrant. So if anybody has a good name for a Taiwan pieris that's fragrant, let me know. But this is a, a kind of a shrubby plant. We've propagated it and are planting it in some different areas. Want to make sure that that fragrance is really as good as it always seems in the, the laugh house before we do put a name on it. But it is a great plant that we collected in Taiwan. It's a nice evergreen shrub. And finish with a couple of herbaceous things. Cyclamen, depending on species, cyclamen start flowering in fall and can flower all the way through to spring. Most of the ones we, we can grow outside here, again, the foliage comes up in fall and then disappears in, in spring. The most common one, the ivy leaf cyclamen, cyclamen heterofolium, really flowers as the leaves are coming up mostly in the spring, although it can kind of flower sporadically over the summer and, and other times as well. I really, this is my favorite of the hardy ones, is cyclamen coom. Cyclamen coom has these kind of ovate leaves, these rounded leaves. They can go from being almost pure silver like that one to having this really broad silver edge to this, the more typical from white to pale pink to really 
deep, deep magenta flower mm -hmm. color. And these flower later than the cyclamen heterofolium typically. So they flower with the, the foliage underneath them. And I find them to just be more effective in flower than the cyclamen heterofolium, which are often flowering with, without the, the leaves underneath them. This also gives them time for kind of leaves that have fallen over the winter to kind of start getting matted down and the leaves and the flowers to come up above that. But I just love these little guys. They're a bit more delicate than the, the cyclamen heterofolium. But if you leave them out there, they'll set seed and they'll start, you know, you, you, they'll start almost being a winter ground cover over time if you let them. I think there's, there's a few plants that get me more excited than a beautiful patch of of cyclamen coom. Another kind of one season plant, the flowering quinces, canomalies. These flower during winter when they're spectacular and then they kind of catch a lot of leaves and stuff all the rest of the year. I never would have put them in a talk before because I really didn't like them. They had big thorns. The flowers were often nice, but not always great. And these from Tom Ranney, the double take series, there's orange storm and pink storm and red storm, and they're double flowered and they've got no spines on them. So you get these great flowers and these are really big and really showy without the thorns on there. And so he's really taking them to a new level. And I have to begrudgingly admit that I actually do like these. And what's even crazier, I like the orange one more than the red or the pink one. So he's a good enough plant breeder that he's, he's actually turned me into a, somebody who likes quince. And you can see, you know, these are in the same family as roses. And you can really see these look like roses. So if you were to give me a rose that you said it only flowered once a year, but it flowered in February and didn't have any thorns on it, I would be so excited about that rose, I could barely stand it. So I don't know why I'm turning my nose up at these quinces that look like roses and flower in February when nothing else is, is going on. Rodelea, basically an evergreen witch hazel. I love this plant. I love this plant when it flowers for us. The, the plant Rodelea henryi is, is hardy for us. It'll tolerate our winters. It's loaded with buds out in the garden right now, but if it gets too cold this winter before February, before they start opening, it'll drop the buds without them even opening. But when it does flower, holy cow, it is amazing, amazing evergreen shrub. And so this is one that I think is nice enough, even if it loses its flowers every couple of years or only flowers every couple of years, maybe I should say, it's a nice enough evergreen plant that it's still worth it in the, worth the space and the landscape. And we'll finish up with the daffodils. I like daffodils as much as the next person, but I don't plant personally a lot of the, the big daffodils. They're great. They're cheery. The early ones like February gold start for us in, you know, December or January and are long done before February. But the ones that I really like personally are the really small ones, like these little dwarf hoop and petticoat ones like Cantabricus and Julia Jane, the, these kind of wide flared dwarf ones, and these species like Fernandesii and Lacomii that have small flowers, very grassy like foliage that flower super early. So these things, they'll come up, they flower, and then that foliage is only six or eight inches tall and is really fine and dark green and grassy. You know, in my garden, if, if you don't have enough plants, the old daffodil foliage on big daffodils, like, like the classics, like Carlton and, and February Gold and Ice Follies and those kinds of things, can be really big and coarse in the garden and, and can kind of take away as you move into spring and other things starting to flower. And that foliage has to stay there to photosynthesize to make, you know, make flowers for next year. So I like these little dwarf ones that kind of disappear amongst the other plants when other things start coming up. But again, that's just personal opinion. But these early ones like Fernandesii and Wilcomii, I think are especially, especially nice. Okay, well, gone through a bunch of plants and happy to 
answer any questions. We, we just had a question, Mark, that I don't know the answer. So, uh, Lisa was asking, where does she, where can she get the Rodalia? The only person I know growing it for sale at this point is Nurseries Caroliniana. They're mail order, although they have a nursery there you can go to as well. They're in North Augusta, South Carolina. Nurseries Caroliniana are the only place I know that have them for sale. They're not cheap and they run out of them pretty often, but they're propagating as fast as they can. And they asked, did she miss Edgeworthia? And she said it's her favorite or a favorite of hers. I didn't include it just because I am mixing some things up. It was in there and I took it out, but you see, I already went over an hour. So I had to take out a few things. <laughs> so only a minute for time, not because you don't like it. Uh, oh, Mary, it. Mary oh. just asked, uh, do the small narcissists you talk about need to grow in full sun and gravel or can they be happy in her clay sun with some part sun or clay soil and part sun? I'm glad you asked that. Most of those small narcissists that I need listed, they need sun. They want to bake. It isn't, you know, they need decent drainage, but we actually Brent Heath from Brent and Becky's comes out to take specifically to take pictures of our Narcissus Fernandesii and Lacomii because we have patches of them right by, one's right by our parking lot and another patch right by white concrete pathway and all that reflected heat and everything is great for them. They love that. They grow in, in very hot areas. So they'll tolerate cold, but they love when they're in active growth to get a lot of heat. So they want to be out in full sun. Thanks. Uh, Mary just asked, is anything in the winter flowering that has a scent dwarf? Well, those Daphne are small. They have great fragrance. Help me out, Chris. Or other I don't. I don't think the um, uh, the quinces get all that large. I, I mean, there's not really a dwarf cultivar that I can think of, but they're not. They're not huge. There is a dwarf cultivar called Pygmaea. Are they fragrant? Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Eh, I, I think they have a some, slight one, but not, nothing. Nar- nothing. Some of the narcissus are very, very fragrant. Some winter plants that I didn't put in that tolerate shade and are very fragrant are the the. What do, I forget what we call them, winter box, sarcococa. Some of the sarcococa are you know, nice low plants and are very, very fragrant. I'm told I can't, that's a, that's a plant that I cannot smell, but I'm told they're, they're quite fragrant. Yeah, D- David just added those in there. So yeah, I, I think that's it. I, I think the uh, Daphne are definitely going to be some of the smallest and most fragrant amongst yeah. the group. Yeah, And there, there was a question earlier that I answered, but I wondered if you had any further advice on it. Someone was asking about an evergreen magnolia that'd be good for shade. And I mentioned that Pat McCracken said that his stellar ruby does very well in shade. And I have mine planted underneath a pretty large oak tree and also dry conditions and it's fine. Yeah, I, 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 put a, I, I'm, I don't have room at my house personally, for a lot of magnolias out in sun, my sunny areas are relatively small. And if I plant evergreen magnolias in there, they won't be sunny for very long. So I plant them in the woodlands and they do, they do great there. There's one I didn't mention. I didn't talk about the evergreen magnolias. We have one that is called Eternal Spring. That it's a great name. It starts flowering in January or February and it just keeps on putting out new blooms. So even if they get frozen, it got new new flowers on it. And it, I swear it was flowering into April. It really just kept going and going and going. So I don't know if it's protected or not, but yeah, it's, it's a great plant. Where can we get that magnolia, eternal spring? Eternal spring, I'm not sure. I'm trying, I, I don't remember if it's protected or not. I'm not sure who is growing it or actually where we got it. Oh, let me look real quick where we got ours. Uh, and what do you mean by protected? Well, some plants are patented and that means that not just only the people who have permission can produce it. Right. And so that, that sometimes makes it a little bit harder because sometimes it may be only one place that is is growing it oh actually we got we got it from camellia forest nursery that's good 
oh, that's right, it was from Camellia Forest. So it is probably not protected. So maybe that's a good one for us to encourage some other folks to start producing. The problem is people aren't shopping for plants in February and early March when they're really at their, when they're in peak flower. So that, that can make it a little bit difficult for people. Mm. But we, Thank you. we can certainly propagate it. Someone asked about Eternal Spring Daphne earlier, and I had an answer for them, but I'm, now I'm wondering if they were asking about Eternal Spring Magnolia. So no. if I answered wrong earlier, I'm sorry about that. No, there's an Eternal Spring Daphne. That's a Daphne okay. transatlantica type. Yeah, that's that's what I responded. Yep. I told them we didn't have that one for uh, experiences. And I think that took care of all the questions in the chat. I don't think anyone else had anything. If anyone has a question, go ahead and answer it right now while you have us. Yes. Do I want to put you on the spot, Mark, for the plant buggy? Just thought about that. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if we plant buggy not up yet. We're we're getting back into the, the swing of things. Hey, Gus. He's, he's trying to say that Happy New Year's. Yep. Yes. They did have the plant buggy out uh, on Tuesday and the plant list was available on Monday. So it must be still a work in progress, but coming soon. Yeah. And that to list is that. in our horticulture section underneath sales on our website. And the buggy will be out on Thursday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Do I have any opinion on Carolina jasmine? Yeah, it's a great plant. It starts flowering early. I, you know, it starts usually a little bit later than where I was ending this, but still in what would be considered winter. It's a uh, fantastic fragrant vine, bright gold flowers, evergreen, hard to beat. That's what Gus was was barking about. The uh, you know, jazz. What is the best time to take cuttings from Daphne? Oh, we do. I do Daphne almost any time. It's really easy to root. You just wanted a well-drained mix. They'll rot out pretty easily. Eternal fragrance is patented. We we do ha we grow patented plants. You know, the question was, do we stay away from patented plants? We do grow patented plants in order to evaluate them, but we have to get permission to propagate and sell them. We can't, you know, give cuttings to other growers, which is really part of what we try to do. So, you know, we, we do fewer of those than we do other things, you know, fewer of the protective plants. Any other things? Yeah, if somebody mentioned, I said Pine Knot Farms, I said in North Carolina, but it is Pine Knot Farms in Virginia. It was on the chat, but make sure you do that. Don't go to, don't put in the one in North Carolina or else you'll be very disappointed it's in Virginia. And when they do their winter open house, which is in February, they have their hellebores there, but they also usually have other vendors who are selling a lot of witch hazels, Daphne, hmm. Osmanthus, cyclamen, really choice cyclamen. I have bought more than my share of those. So there, it's a great to visit that. You didn't say I, anything I about that. primroses. Did you, do you have anything, opinion about primroses? So I don't have a lot of opinions about primroses. Camellia Forest did some great work uh, there breeding some heat tolerant vulgaris type primroses that do pretty well. Mostly they don't, a lot of the primroses don't love our, our heat and don't persist long. The ones that I stick to mostly are the Primula japonica, which are very early flowering ones that there's a whole lot of variety of those. Primula, Primula, excuse me, Primula siboldii is, is what I meant, which is a Japanese primrose. Primula siboldii and Primula kisoena are the two that I mostly grow. If you're going to go with kind of the, the more, the old fashioned common primroses. If you can find the one that's 
Primula Dale Henderson, which we sometimes offer the Virginia Beach Garden Club off if in Virginia. Go to one of their plant sales. They always have it. Dale Henderson was a longtime member there and actually funded, she funded an internship with her estate here at, at the Ralston Arboretum. But Primula Dale Henderson is one of the very best. And it's got this soft coral orange, kind of peachy orange flower that is just, just gorgeous. We try and propagate it every now and then and, and get it out to people, but that's, that's one of my favorites. Mm, nice. Other questions? Nope, see anything else in the chat, Mark? Fantastic, well, Gus and I wish you all a very good new year. Remember, if you missed the tour that we had yesterday, it'll be on the YouTube channel soon and a lot of other stuff on there. If you haven't gone to our YouTube channel before, you should go. And if you subscribe, you'll just get a, a notice every time Chris uploads a new video. And there is so much there. And it's not just from the past 10 months. There is stuff from years and years ago that we've been adding to that and some great historical things. It's really just this treasure trove. I, I keep diving into it and watching. I don't watch myself. I watch other people. But it's, it's really good. We know a video is going back through 2011. Not all of them through 2011, but that, that's as far back as I've gotten as I've added some of the ones from the archives. But I think regular videos date back to about 2013 or 2014. So, so yeah, a lot there. And for long, keep you busy. Yeah, well, I will see everybody next week. Looking forward to it. Glad to, glad to be back doing this. I've missed everybody. We missed you too, Mark. Thank you so much. And we missed all of you in the in the audience as well. Have a great week and see you next next Wednesday at three. Happy New Year to you both. Happy New Year to you. I didn't see you on here. I wasn't sure if you were here or not. Oh Bye. yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Always here. She wouldn't miss. She never leaves the Zoom meeting, Mark. <laughs> thank you, Mark. That was a great meeting. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I'll see you next dog. week. <laughs> yeah, the, the dog, dog a scratch for me. <laughs> <laughs>